Any suspicions Tuppence had had that Sheila Perenna was involved in spying died. She continued. If he is innocent, what does it matter? Sheila interrupted her. The police will make up a false case against him and say he was working for the Germans. Tuppence said sharply, My dear child, that isn't true. The English police will do anything. My mother says so. They'll take him away and lock him up, and one morning they'll stand him against a wall and shoot him. The fisherman on the end of the pier said to Mr. Meadows, There's no doubt whatever, I'm afraid, Mr. Grant said. Among his papers was a list of people where he worked who should be approached as possible fascist sympathizers. There was also a very clever idea to mix chemicals into fertilizers, which would have destroyed food crops. He also had a supply of invisible ink. I've only seen the method once before, and then it was buttons which had been soaked in the stuff. When the fellow wanted to use it, he soaked a button in water. Carl von Dynam's invisible ink wasn't in his buttons, it was in his shoelaces. As soon as Tommy reported this conversation to Tuppence, she cried, Tommy, that explains it. What? Betty, don't you remember what I told you she did in my room, taking out my shoelaces and soaking them in water? She must have seen Carl do it. He couldn't risk her talking about it, and so he arranged with that woman for her to be kidnapped. Isn't it nice when things begin to make sense? Now we can move forward. We need to. Tuppence nodded. The news from France was very bad indeed. The British expeditionary force was being pushed back by the Germans, and now the talk of an invasion of Britain had a frightening reality. Tommy said, I think that Carl von Dynam was only a link in the chain, not N or M, who are probably the most important German agents in England. So, is Mrs. Perenna M? And do you really think her daughter isn't involved in this tuppence? I'm quite sure of it. First, the man she loves is proved to be a spy, and if her mother is also one, she's not going to have much left, is she? And supposing we're wrong, that M or N is someone else? I've got some other ideas, you know. Which are? I think I'll keep them to myself for a bit. We'll see which of us is right. Well, I think we've got to find out where Mrs. Perenna goes, who she meets, everything. You'd better tell our old friend Albert to follow her this afternoon. He'll be glad to have something to do at last. You can do that. I'm busy. Why? What are you doing? Tommy said, I'm playing golf. Chapter 9 It seems quite like old times, doesn't it, madam? said Albert. He smiled happily. Tuppence asked about his wife. Oh, she's all right. Just doesn't like being away from London and me, she says. I'm not sure we should involve you in this adventure, Albert, worried Tuppence. Nonsense, madam. I tried to join the army, but they said, wait for people your age to be called up. And me? Perfectly fit, and only too eager to get at those Germans. Fifth column, that's what we're up against, so the newspapers say. And I'm ready to assist you and Captain Beresford in any way you need me to. Good. Now I'll tell you what we want you to do. After their game of golf, Tommy went to have supper with Commander Haydock at Smuggler's Rest. A tall, middle-aged manservant served them with the skill of a restaurant waiter. When the man had left the room, Tommy complimented the commander on him. Yes, I was lucky to get Appledore. How did you get him? He answered an advertisement. He had excellent references, was far better than any of the others who applied for the job, and asked for very low wages. So of course I hired him immediately. Tommy laughed. The war has certainly robbed us of much of our good restaurant service. Most good waiters were foreigners. It doesn't seem to come naturally to Englishmen. Acting like a servant doesn't come easily to the English bulldog, said the commander. 
and went on to say that there would be a successful German invasion in the near future. There's no organization here, no proper coordination. Appledore brought whiskey while the commander was talking. And there are spies everywhere. It was the same in the last war. Foreign hairdressers, waiters. Tommy thought, waiters? Appledore speaks perfect English, but many Germans do. All these forms to fill in with idiotic questions, continued the commander. Tommy spoke on an impulse. The words fitted perfectly with what the commander was just saying. I know, such as, what is your name, answer N or M. There was a crash as Appledore dropped a glass. Tommy's hand was soaked in whiskey. The man stammered, S sorry, sir. Haydock was very angry and shouted at Appledore. You clumsy fool! What do you think you're doing? Haydock continued for some minutes with more angry words. Tommy was embarrassed for Appledore, but suddenly the commander's anger passed. Come along and wash that whiskey off, Meadows. Tommy was soon in the luxurious bathroom. He washed his hands, then turned from the wash basin to dry them. He didn't notice that a bar of soap had dropped onto the floor. His foot stepped on it and a moment later he skidded across the floor, arms outstretched. One hand came up against the right-hand tap of the bath. The other pushed heavily against the side of a small bathroom cabinet, and his foot hit the end panel of the bath. Immediately, the bath slid out from the wall, and Tommy found himself looking into a cupboard that contained a wireless transmitter. The commander appeared in the doorway and several things fell into place in Tommy's brain. Had he been blind? That cheerful red face was a mask. It was really the face of an arrogant Prussian officer. He remembered from long ago seeing a Prussian bully shouting at a soldier just as Commander Haydock had shouted at Appledore. And it all fitted in. The enemy agent, Hahn, had been sent first in order to prepare Smuggler's Rest. He then drew attention to himself, allowing Commander Haydock to unmask him. How natural that Haydock should buy the place and then tell the story to everyone he met. And so, N, securely settled in his place with his secret transmitter and his helpers at Sans Souci, was ready to carry out Germany's plan. Tommy knew that he was in deadly danger, unless he could act the part of the stupid Englishman well enough. He turned to Haydock with a laugh. By Jove, was this another of Hans' little gadgets? You didn't show me this the other day. Haydock stood as though made of stone for a minute. Then he relaxed. Damn funny, Meadows. You went skating over the floor like a ballet dancer. With an arm round Tommy's shoulders, Haydock took him into the sitting room. Half an hour later, Mr. Meadows stood up. I really must be going now. It's getting quite late. Still talking, Mr. Meadows walked towards the door. He was in the hall. He opened the front door. They were going to let him get away with it. The two men stood talking, arranging another golf match for Saturday. Tommy thought angrily, There'll be no next Saturday for you, Haydock, or whatever your real name is. Voices came from the road. Two men returning from a walk. Men Tommy and the commander knew who played at the golf club. Tommy called to them. They stopped for a few words with Haydock. Then Tommy walked off with them. He had managed to escape. It was so lucky that these men had come along. Tommy said goodbye to them at the gate of Saint Souci and walked up the drive whistling softly. He had just turned the dark corner by some large bushes when something heavy came down on his head and he fell into blackness. At breakfast the next morning, Tuppence was aware of a tension in the atmosphere before Mrs. Perenna left the room. Major Bletchley gave a deep laugh. <laughs> Mrs. Perenna is in a very bad mood, he remarked. Meadows has been out all night. 
hasn't come home yet. What? exclaimed Tuppence. Oh dear, said Miss Minton, her face reddening. Mrs. Cayley looked shocked. Mrs. O'Rourke merely grinned. Ah, oh, well, boys will be boys. Tuppence tried to reassure herself. She and Tommy had agreed that neither should be worried if the other was absent for no apparent reason. She was sure that he would communicate with her, or just arrive, very soon. In the evening, Mrs. Perenna reluctantly agreed to ring up the police. A sergeant arrived, and certain facts were noted. Mr. Meadows had left Commander Haydock's house at half-past ten. From there, he had walked with Mr. Walters and Dr. Curtis to the gate of Sanssouci. From that moment, Mr. Meadows had disappeared. Tuppence knew that Mrs. Perenna had, according to Mrs. Sprout, been out last night, and she believed her to be the most likely suspect in Tommy's disappearance. But Sheila and Major Bletchley had been at the cinema, though separately, and the way that he had insisted on describing the whole film might suggest to a suspicious mind that he was establishing an alibi. And Mr. Cayley had gone for a walk round the garden and had been out for some time. It was very unlike him to risk being out in the cool night air. So was he really as ill as he claimed? Many miles away, at a secret intelligence location, Tuppence Beresford's daughter was sitting at her desk, frowning. What's the matter, Deborah? You're looking worried. Deborah Beresford looked up at Tony Marsden. He was one of the most brilliant beginners in the coding department. It's my mother. I'm a bit worried about her. She was annoyed because nobody seemed to want her in this war. So she went down to Cornwall to stay with an aunt. But I told Charles, my boyfriend, who was going down to see his parents, who live in Cornwall, to go and visit her. And he did. And she wasn't there. Wasn't there? No. And she hadn't been there. Not at all. Where's, I mean, your father? Oh, he's in Scotland somewhere. Or maybe your mother's gone to join him. She can't. He's in one of those secret areas where wives can't go. Oh, uh, well, I suppose she's just gone away somewhere. But why? It's so strange. She's been sending me letters, talking about her aunt and her garden and everything. I know, I know, said Tony hastily. Of course she'd want you to think. I mean, nowadays, well, people do go away now and again, if you know what I mean. No. If you think Mother's just gone away with someone, you're wrong. Mother and Father are devoted to each other, really devoted. But the odd thing is that the other day someone said they'd seen Mother in Leehampton. I said it couldn't be her because she was in Cornwall. But now I wonder. Leehampton? Yes. It's the last place Mother would go to. There's nothing to do there, and only old colonels and unmarried ladies live there. Doesn't sound a likely place, said Tony. He lit a cigarette and asked casually, What did your mother do in the last war? She was a nurse. I thought perhaps she'd been like you, in British intelligence. Oh, mother would never have been able to do this sort of work although she and father did get involved in searching for secret papers and spies at one point. Of course, they exaggerate it and make it all sound as though it had been very important. On the following day, Deborah returned to her rooms and was puzzled by something unfamiliar in the appearance of her bedroom. It took her a few minutes to discover what it was. Then she rang the bell and asked her landlady what had happened to the big photograph that stood on the chest of drawers. Mrs. Rowley said she hadn't touched it. Maybe it had been Gladys, the maid. But Gladys also denied having removed it. A man who'd come about the gas had been in Deborah's room, she said. But Deborah refused to believe that an employee of the gas company would have stolen the photograph. 
It was more likely, in Deborah's opinion, that Gladys had accidentally broken the photograph frame and had hidden it in the rubbish bin. Deborah didn't worry about it. She'd get her mother to send her another photo of herself. Chapter 10 It was Tuppence's turn to talk to the fisherman on the end of the pier. She had hoped that Mr. Grant might have had some comfort for her, but no news of any kind had come from Tommy. Trying her best to make her voice assured and businesslike, Tuppence said, I continue, of course. Of course. There will be time for tears after the battle. We're in the middle of the battle now, and time is short. One piece of information you brought us has been proved correct. You overheard a reference to the fourth when you listened to that telephone conversation in the hall at Saint Souci. The fourth referred to is the fourth of next month. It's the date fixed for the big attack on this country. You're sure? Yes, the fourth is the day. But if you know that... We know the day. We know, or think we know, where. We're as ready as we can be. But it's the fifth column here we want to know about. A dozen men in high places, in command of troops in vital areas, can issue conflicting orders and throw the country into a state of confusion. This is necessary for the German plan to succeed. We've got to have inside information in time. We have received information that Mrs. Perenna is a member of the IRA with anti-British sympathies, but we can't get proof. So keep going, Mrs. Beresford. Go on and do your best. The fourth, said Tuppence. That's barely a week ahead. It's a week exactly. She frowned and began planning a new form of attack. You see, Albert, it's a possibility, Tuppence said a few hours later. I see what you mean, madam, of course, but I don't like the idea very much, I must say. I think it might work. Yes, madam, but it's exposing yourself to attack. That's what I don't like, and I'm sure Mr. Beresford wouldn't like it either. Albert, we've done what we could, staying hidden. It seems to me that now the only chance is to come out into the open. How were you thinking of managing it, madam? Tuppence said. I thought I might lose a letter I'd written, make a lot of fuss about it, seem very upset. Then it would be found in the hall, and Beatrice would probably put it on the table. Then the right person would take a look at it. What would be in the letter? Oh, that I'd been successful in discovering the identity of the person in question, and that I was to make a full report personally tomorrow. Then, you see, Albert, N or M would have to come out in the open and try to kill me. Yes, and maybe they'd manage it too. Not if I was on my guard. They'd have, I think, to trick me into going to some isolated place. That's where your part would come in, because they don't know about you. Tuppence was just leaving the local library, when she was startled by a voice calling, Mrs. Beresford! She turned to see a tall, dark young man with a slightly embarrassed smile. Do you remember me? he asked. I came to the flat with Deborah one day. Deborah's friends. There were so many of them, and all looked very alike to Tuppence. It was annoying to have been recognized by one of Deborah's young men just now. I'm Anthony Marsden, explained the young man. Tuppence murmured. Oh, of course, and shook hands. Tony Marsden went on. I'm very glad to have found you, Mrs. Beresford. 